Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Weekend Wrap brought to you by Crowcast. My name is Phoenix, and as always, I'm joined by Nikki. How you going, Nick? Uh, I have a very croaky voice from yelling at umpires. <laughs> and Macca, how you doing, Mac? Not doing very well, thanks, mate. That's good. Now, something just happened with the old uh, Facebook feed, I reckon. I oh, know, I'm still broadcasting. I don't, just don't know what's going on. Anyway, if uh, you're watching on Facebook and it's not happening, my apologies. I'll post up audio if the video isn't working. Um, but Facebook is telling me it's working. So uh, never mind, we'll carry on. Ladies and gentlemen, what was that that we just witnessed? Well, from a spectator point of view, <laughs> um, one of the one of the worst games from a viewing point of view that you could possibly get, and um, the three canary-coloured creatures running around the centre, they were the main cause of that because uh, they ignored free after free that was being paid elsewhere in other games this week. There's no doubt that the umpires have been uh, told, instructed to give the player with the ball a little bit more time to get rid of the ball. But what we saw today was ridiculous. It was and, pretty funny. Uh, yeah, and then, then if you're going to give our players more time to get rid of the ball, that, that doesn't mean to say you can ignore hits to the head and <laughs> other pushes in the back and other things like that as well. So it, it was the most incompetent piece of umpiring I've seen for a long time. Which, which is a real pity because um, I think what I, I heard on the radio that Tex reported at the end of the game and because um, I was listening on the radio and they, they were interviewing Matt Crouch was that was one of the most intense heat, like intense games from contest to contest and it was very finals-like um, in terms of pressure and it didn't abate for the whole game. So kudos to both teams for doing that. Um Ross Lyon had a very specific game plan to try and, well, they actually succeeded, hold back our run. Um, and the Frio players to the last gasp were working so hard to implement that game plan. Now, it was very defensively mindset, which isn't an attractive game of football, but good teams win ugly. Oh, there's no doubt. It was, you know, it was gladiatorial and, and, you had been, uh, it was a very physical game, and the, the players they never got a rest because there were no free kicks, so it just had to keep going and going and going. And uh, I heard the coach say that I think at one stage it was eight minutes he couldn't make an interchange because it was the ball wasn't stopping. Yeah, and no scorings, and uh, you know no opportunity to to do anything. So um, yeah, as you said, Mickey, it, uh, they did try and. Uh, Close the game down a lot so that we made it very difficult for us to score, and it was a, a very physical contest. And uh, and uh, some of the physical the beats for us still there. And then, no, Cameron Nellis Yolman, I, I thought it was fantastic, and Greenwood, etc. So um, yeah, we we outlasted them, and we just used the ball a little bit better. Not not a lot, but we did just that little bit better, and we won the game. Well. To my way of thinking, a win's a win, and whenever Ross Lyon comes to play with a negative mindset uh, and trying to just shut you down and you beat him at his own game, then to me that's a positive. So uh, that's the way I look at it. But anyway, look, uh, we've got lots to go through, so let's head into the scores, shall we? What? Oh, well, I was going well with my footy tips <laughs> until today. Like today, absolutely destroyed me. Unfortunately. Did you get the Western Bulldogs? I picked the Western Bulldogs. Uh, I oh, didn't pick. Sneaky bastard! I didn't pick Melbourne, but I don't think anyone else did either. But I jagged the the no. bull, Bulldogs. I did. I did. You picked Melbourne, did you? Yes, I, I did. Did you pick the Bullies? Uh, did I pick Bulldogs? No, I did not pick the Bulldogs. No. No, so but I, was, I did. I got eight. I picked eight. Yeah, I was uh, I was one down coming into Sunday, and uh, Carlton burnt me. Uh, Essendon burnt me, and the Crows uh, did the right thing. So anyway, let's head into the scores <laughs> roundout, shall we? Friday night, uh, Collingwood probably showed us where Port really are at. Um, 
comfortably accounting for the Little Cousins. 15 goals, 18, 108 to Port, 10 goals, 9, 69. A margin there of 39 points in the end, which probably flattered Port a little bit, I think. It did, because they got a couple of uh, scores near the end of the game, which made it look a little bit better. And for me, there's a bit of sadness in this game, because I had 20 bucks on Collingwood to win by 40-plus at uh, 320. <laughs> they were leading by 40-plus 40 with yeah. uh, 11 seconds to go, and Collingwood clearing the ball. And he shakes it out of bounds. The ball gets turned over to Port. They keep to the goal square, and... Um, yeah, Power Pepper kicks a bloody point as the siren's going. I've lost my money. Can't, can't so, be uh, happy with that, Mac. No, no, I was really unhappy with that. But I was happy. Look, I got some joy back knowing that there were a lot of Port supporters hurting out there. That makes me feel good. And um, so uh, they aren't the real deal Port. They, they're better than perhaps what a lot of people thought. Uh, they're, they're up there around about that seventh to ninth position. But uh, Collingwood, I think, are the real deal. That they'll be up there in, in in the final four. Go ahead, Nick. And Nick mm. doesn't care. I didn't see you it. You don't care. All right. So no, no. My my team was <laughs> playing on Friday night, so I was actually at that game. Right. Very good. Well, um, before we move on, I'd just like to say hello to everyone uh, in the Facebook chat, uh, in particularly my son, who's twenty five today and at whose house I've been spending some time this afternoon. Uh, so happy birthday, Cam. Uh, he joins me on the Rev Up, uh, the pre-game pre show. And, uh, yeah, we've had a few cans, so... <laughs> <laughs> so tonight we'll, ought to be interesting. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Just don't cross me, Nicky, and we'll all be good. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, Port... Probably, look, I think Collingwood just exposed Port for what they are, which is a hard-working mm. side without a lot of class and with a few young kids that uh, need a, just need a few games. I think they're actually building a pretty good squad, Port. But, uh, they not, are. Th not yet, though. Not yet. Anyway, uh, Saturday, uh, Melbourne burning me. Uh, getting up over Hawthorne, last gasp win, 11 goals, 13, 79 to 11 goals, 8, 74, a margin of five points. Hawthorne uh, uh, really not travelling well. I, 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 I still don't rate Melbourne, but uh, Hawthorne just fell in a hole. Well, I, the reason I picked Melbourne was because of the fact that Hawthorne, they beat Carlton by and would have lost in another five seconds. Uh, and I thought, you know, if they struggle like that against Carlton, Melbourne are going to put one together with some semblance of a game plan eventually. Uh, and uh, that's what happened. And, uh, um, I mean, we wouldn't call it a, a battle of the, of the Titans because it was a very close game again and Melbourne fell in the, the right way this time and Hawthorne didn't. But, oh, buddy, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Macca! <laughs> hey, sorry Macca, I'm the, only, I'm the only bloke that does the, sound, does the sound effects around here, all right? If you're going to muscle in on my stuff... Know. That's my bloody well, phone. You've hidden, you've hidden the sound effects from us at the moment, so I think Macca was just, you know, <laughs> bringing something in so that he and I could hear it. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Did I say something? Um, yeah, the problem about that particular game right now, not going like for the classics, and uh, they just, Melbourne just outslugged Hawthorne to win by five points, and uh, neither of those are going to shape the finals. No, I just said in the chat, and of course the Hawks pulled out their one decent performance of the year against us. Well, we allowed it to happen too, though, Nick. Poor yeah, coaching true. That yeah, it's true to form with us. Never mind. Um, look, uh, the next game, I don't have much to say about that game. Uh, oh. The next game, as I bring up my website again, uh, the Giants, I look. Giants are shaping up really nicely, in my opinion. Uh, 18 goals, 614 to 10 goals, 1070. I know it was only the Saints, but the Giants had a few out. And uh, I reckon one, that, one I, out. Yeah, Kelly and uh, Davis and a couple others, I think. They're looking all right, the Giants, at the moment. Yep. Yeah. Um, they, they'll be, they'll be able to definitely, the, but certainly in the top six and possibly top four. So. Um, They've got, they've got a lot of classy players, so they'll be there when the whips are cracking. Yeah, I only saw bits of that game because um, there was supercars on. Um, but the, the bits that I did see, and 
unlike a lot of other people, I actually do rate the ball movement that Saints are, can get at times. And so they were able to to get a bit of the, their free flowing, but the Giants were doing very well at shutting that down, like we did um, the week before. But I I do agree with you, Fiend. I, th- I think they're building very nicely. They seem to have turned the corner in terms of those players who would wait for things to happen because that's what they used to because of their talent. They're, they're now making it happen. Yeah, good point, Nikki. Yep. Uh, agree, 100%. Uh, Brisbane Lions having a good win over Sydney who continue to wallow at the moment. Uh, Brisbane, 14 goals, 19 at home, 103 to Sydney, 12, 9, 81. Uh, the Lions ticking over okay after a little bit of a hiccup last week and Sydney just sort of bumbling along at the moment. Yeah, the one thing about that game, it just confirmed to in, in our minds that, uh, you know, Sydney, uh, I look back and it's been a long time since uh, the Brisbane Lions have beaten Sydney. Uh, they are, they're really at rock bottom, in my opinion. Um, when I say rock bottom, I'm, I don't want them to be rock bottom. I want them to be above bloody Carlton so that Carlton could be bottom. But uh, at the moment, they're struggling to beat anybody. And uh, yet you go through their side, they've got some quite good players in there. So has long have I been there too long? Because they just don't seem to be playing the, the game style that's going to win. I think you're dead set yeah, right, Mac. I think Longmire's been there too long now. Sorry, Nick, yeah. go on. Oh, that, that's the same point I was going to make. The, you can just kind of tell. They, they've still got quality players, so I, I think they'll manage to jag a couple of games. Um, but I, I think they definitely need a change and a new voice from the coaching box. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right, Nick. They've got enough talent. Uh, they're a good team. Their squad hasn't changed that much since they were contending. Um, but I think everything's just a little bit stale there at Sydney at the moment. Um, I reckon they've been caught on the hop a bit with Drew jumping ship. And um, I reckon they'll be looking to move Johnny Longmire on at the end of the season. And, you know, let's not downplay Longmire's been excellent for them. But uh, I think you can you can be there too long and, this, and the players just get sick of the same message. Uh, the Bulldogs are getting up over a, a listless Richmond. Uh, uh, Western Bulldogs, 15 goals, 9.99 to Richmond, 7 goals, 10.52. Wasn't a fantastic game of footy, but Richmond don't look too flash at the moment with a couple out. Well, I've, I've gone out by this day, so I can't comment on these last two games. Well, so, what is it? Norton um, bettered Carey's, was it contested mark record or something? No, uh, not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Um, he was uh, one off, I think. I did. Yeah. I did. I did see that one play where you know the guy who's about seventy out, just kind of waiting for the indication of where do I kick it, and he just pointed up, <laughs> and he put it up, and he marked it. Um, He's a player, Norton. Though. He's a genuine player. Nikki. Yeah. And and the the issue there is that. Um, for Richmond is, I mean, Vlosten went off injured for part of the game. Did he come back on at all? I'm not sure. I can't comment on that one. But didn't yeah, but it, it's without Vlosten, without um, Rance and oh, who else is missing from the back line? They've got somebody else who's missing from the back line. Some other They're bloke. in big trouble. Yeah, some <laughs> other blokes missing from the back line. Yeah, Rance. Some well, one of, one of them. Well, no, we know Rance is, oh, I think it might be Asprey. Um, that they've had out with injury and that's exposed them in the back half. And the fact that the Bulldogs, the Bulldogs were able to expose them with that forward line that they've got. Uh, the bull, uh, Look, you know, Nick, I only said last week, the Bulldogs are, are the type of team that will get you now and again. Yeah. Because you know, they Absolutely. do run pretty hard and, and they move the ball pretty quick and it's all chaos and, you know, no real standouts, but... Uh, you know, weight of numbers sometimes, and I think that's what got. I think they actually got Richmond with a bit more intensity, to be honest with you. Mm. Anyway, uh, the other game on Saturday was the West Coast getting up over the Suns. The Suns coming home, all right, but the West Coast prevailing 11 goals, 14, 80 to 8 goals, 9, 57, a margin of 23 points. They're not a terrible result uh, for the Suns, uh, given they've been travelling like bloody. David Attenborough lately, but uh, yeah, the Eagles are a much needed win, really. 
Yeah, but the one thing I would have to say about that particular game is, and can really stolen by really uh, a write up by one of the Western Australian reporters that basically it really did West Coast no uh, no favours because uh, Gold Coast uh, have not got a star started team. They did get a bit of a lead early, and then um, Gold Coast wormed their way back into the game nearly. So it's one of those games they're always going to win it, but unimpressively. So we're not quite convinced on West Coast at the moment? No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I don't think... I think they're just going, but look, they weren't convincing until after the bye last year either, let's not forget. And I think... True. I I think the AFL seasons these days are shaping as a, a, a battle of attrition and you want to be up at the right time and I think you just need to get to the bye in a decent position and... Yeah, West Coast are only just going at the moment, but there's probably a handful of teams in a similar situation and uh, uh, they've got too much talent. You don't win a grand final uh, without having a bit of talent and I think uh, at this stage, four points is four points and they'd be happy just to get away with a win, I think. Good point, Fee, because they do have a lot of talent in the team. Yeah. Uh, Look, Sunday, Carlton, I'm never tipping Carlton again, honestly, because if they couldn't win that game, they were actually (laughs) showing some decent form. North have been playing like absolute shit, and Carlton have been playing all right, and yet they could only kick eight goals against bloody North Melbourne. North Melbourne, 18 goals, 12-120, to a hapless Carlton, eight goals, 14-62, a margin of 58 points, if you don't mind, against a team that's below you on the ladder. And, you know, when you're 16th on the ladder, you should be able to get closer to the 18th team, I would have thought. Well, did you see the outside for Carlton? I mean, they're not a good team and they couldn't afford to lose players like Simpson, Cruiser, etc. So um, they, they had four outs that were significant outs. Um, um, McGovern's another one. Um, and I thought to myself, they can't win. Uh, they really can't win. And uh, North Melbourne... Uh, I knew that there'd be nothing special in the sense of they, they were never a great team to watch, but they, I thought they'd just get a workmanlike win, and that's exactly what happened. They just they, they would, in fact, it turned out that I thought they won by, well, I obviously won by a lot more than I thought they would. Um, Carlton were worse than I thought they would be as well. They they were very, they were terrible, Carlton, though. No reason why they shouldn't have won that, Macca. Well, on they were down on personnel, definitely down on personnel. Carlton Oh, yeah, no. but... Look, and you, when you're down at 16th and you're down on personnel on top of that, you're not going to come out and... And, and North Melbourne aren't a true 18th side, I don't think. Oh, see, I disagree with that. I don't rate North at all. And I think if, you, if you're in the Carlton squad at the moment, you've got a genuine opportunity to forge out an AFL career if you stick your hand up when you get an opportunity. And there's a few blokes who got an opportunity on the weekend uh, or today... And they just did nothing. And I, I just think it was a, a, a passionate, passionless performance by a squad who's supposedly moving forward. Um, and if they can only rely on their best 22 and fall away that quickly, then they really haven't turned the corner at all, as far as I'm concerned. No, but, you know, the North Melbourne killed them in Ruck. No, they don't cruise in Ruck. They got killed there and they got killed around the packs and, yeah. Uh, they really, really didn't have much going for them at all, other than Cripps trying his guts out and Walsh occasionally. Very weak performance. My, my son's on the speaker chat trying to make sense. He's had about a dozen bloody scotches. Shut up, Cameron. <laughs> um, it makes it hard. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he wants he wants to cook some bread. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can. <laughs> uh, look, I also backed bloody Essendon to cause an upset at the at the MCG versus the Cats. My logic was that the Cats don't handle the G terribly well, and Melbourne uh, Essendon might have been able to catch them with a bit of pace. But you know, that's far too much logic. So Geelong get up thirteen goals, eight eighty six to uh, Essendon seven goals, twelve fifty four, and uh, my tips go down the toilet, Macca. <laughs> Well, no, I always thought this one would, would go to Geelong. Um, Essendon, uh, I think they're a good... They're, they're a side that, that are developing and they they play a certain style of football. But Ge- Geelong have got a pretty complete side at the moment. Um, I can't identify any particular weakness in their team at the moment. They've got a good defence. Uh, they've got a good, very good midfield. And to the point where they can 
uh, spread some of their other midfielders out and put them into half forward flanks and wings, etc. So, uh, you know, they're going very, very well. I, and uh, Dangerfield had a poor game. He, I think about him. He gets if he gets an injury, he, he looks like he's dying. You know, he twisted his ankle a little bit. And he went off, went downstairs as if he was dead. Ate him about ninety seconds. Let old lady runs out on the oval as if he's one hundred percent fit again. So, but then he uh, twisted his knee a little bit, and uh, that was the end of him. So, uh, I don't know whether it's a, a serious injury or not. But uh, I think Geelong, they, Geelong, Collingwood, no, in my, in my mind, no doubt. The two teams to beat at this stage. Well, that could change as the season goes on, but at this stage. Be interesting to see what happens about Ablett as to whether the AFL actually has the balls to follow through with um, because he jumped up. It wasn't a bad, it wasn't a vicious blow though, Nikki. It wasn't, but he jumped up in the air to get him and that needs to you, you can't have that. But we'll see exactly how um how protected he is. Nikki, you know exactly how it's going to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. It doesn't even worth... Yeah, it's not even worth discussing because we know it's going to be a fine and, you know, Gary's a champion. It was unintentional. He just happened to trip and go two feet in the air. Um, you know, it's... You know, we know how it's going to go. Texas get six weeks. Yeah, 100% right. Anyway, so uh, after all that bloody palaver, uh, interesting ladder. We've got Geelong on top with 24, a game clear of Collingwood. Uh, the Giants and the Lions hanging in there on 20. Uh, Frio after their loss draw even with us, Port, St Kilda inside the eight, and then Richmond and the Eagles outside of the eight. Essendon, the Bulldogs, Hawthorne and Gold Coast on 12 points with four wins. Uh, North Melbourne and Melbourne on eight points. Carlton sinking to the bottom where we want them to be with Sydney on four points. And you'd back Sydney to end up with a couple more wins than Carlton. So uh, pick one's looking good. Pick one's looking good at this stage. Yeah, well, um, as you said, uh, on form, Carlton might win two or three more games for the year, but you couldn't see them winning much more than that, and that will probably put them in bottom spot. Yeah, no, they're cooked. I, I, I've i lost, not that I had any respect for that bloody club in the first place, but after, uh, how, you, how long can you keep telling your supporters that you're in a rebuild, on the rise, blah, 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 all that rubbish, and then they serve up that crap. They got absolutely pants by North Melbourne today, Mac. And, uh, you know, for a side that's supposedly on the way back, that was just a soft, insipid performance. And if I was a bloody Carlton supporter, I'd be microwaving the membership. Well, they certainly... How now? Track. They're not Richmond fans. No, although they, they did boo their own team when they came off, Nicky, at half time. Oh, yeah. You're kidding. Bloody deserved yeah, it too. It was weak. Well, we did, and and when they, hey, to put it in context, they scored more at half time than what we did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but they had slightly more on the opposite side of the uh, ledger. <laughs> True. Well, I, I don't know. I I know this is the Crows um, rap, but uh, you know, to be honest with you, uh, how can how can teams like that, with all the with all the uh, the equalisation and all the rest of it that goes on in this competition, how can a team, how can a club like that continue to serve up that sort of rubbish? Well, you know, it becomes endemic in a club and um, they've accepted low standards previously and that's, that's, that's what they've set now. That it's very difficult to change. Well, and and, uh, the, and the I think they've got is, the right coach to do it. The good news is, Macca, that while I was padding that out talking about a team that I don't give a rat's about, I've actually found the <laughs> audio for the match talk. So let's talk about the Crows <laughs> game, shall we? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. The only reason I'm talking about Carlton, I couldn't give a rat's ass to be honest with you. Um, so it was Adelaide uh, in a very, very hard fought win today uh, against Frio, a Frio team that came to shut us down. And I thought it was very instructive during the week, uh, Don's press conference, where he specifically stated that uh, we were looking at Fremantle and how we were going to shut them down. And it was an early indication, in my opinion, that he knew what they were going to bring and we were going to counter it rather than. Uh, you know, fall into the trap 
of getting done on the on the rebound by Fremo. We shut it down with him and we we uh, rolled the sleeves up and and played hard and gutsy and contested footy. And we got up seven goals nine fifty one to five goals four thirty four, a margin of seventeen points in the end, which is probably worth about fifty points in the context of the low scoring game. Yep, and I think you, I think you summed it up very well because I read that same article and thought exactly the same as you that it's this is going to be um, you know Lockhorn's job and uh, no no uh, plays for the the week and uh, it certainly wasn't that. Um, uh, we have commented on the umpiring before because I thought it was absolutely terrible and there are rules in the game and they should be observed and that goes both ways but um, I think they they turn what could have been a good, very, very, very good game of football into at one, well, certainly in the first half, into a rolling brawl. And uh, um, that was a bit disappointing. But having said that, uh, the one good thing about it, that type of footy does separate the weak out uh, from the uh, the strong or the strong from the weak. And to our credit, I don't think there were really too many weak ones wearing a crow's jumper. I was one on two, no. Mac. Sorry, Nick. Sorry, Nick. Go on. Um, just what you kind of said there, Fien, about that we were going to have a way to stop them, and I saw that um, at the game. I'm not sure how well it it showed up on TV, but we were denying them the fast run, which they like to do, and and that break. And I thought around the contest there were a couple of times early we didn't quite man up on them having the two extra out the back. We gave them just a little bit too much space um but the at the ball the contest the way we managed to shut down and pressure uh when they were trying to flick the ball around and get it out um i thought was really well done for the majority of the game yeah i look I don't know how long... I, I think Fremantle have gotten to the point now where they've outgrown Ross Lyon. If you have a look at their forward, forward yeah. line, and we, Cam and I talked about it on uh, on the previous show, that's one hell of a forward line on paper now, and yet they just refuse to actually play an attacking brand of football. And how long is Ross Lyon going to rely on a nil-all draw um, <laughs> to keep his side in the contest? <laughs> at some stage, he's going to put his nuts on the line and actually play an attacking brand of football because you've got three or four strong forwards up there um, and he's not taking advantage of it, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I think it's a very good point you raised because they've never had a, a decent forward. Now they've got th- they had three uh, potential scoring uh, possibilities uh, up there today, uh, but certainly not the way the game was played because of the way that Lyon wants it to be played. And... It may, and certainly it destroys uh, key forwards in terms of their their ability to influence a game to, by marking and kicking goals because the um, best a key forward can basically do in these type of games is get the ball down the ground because there's so many back and going back into the packs, etc. So, uh, yeah, I think in, in one way it'd be, it would have been an interesting game if Lyon had played it on an open base. Maybe we would have run all over them or maybe they, they would have done a lot better, but we'll never know because he doesn't seem to want to play that way. Well, Brent um, points out on the chat that they've actually been scoring more than they have in the past, and that will may well be the case, but they don't play attacking footy against strong teams. They don't mind uh, unleashing a little bit against the weaker sides, but against the strong teams. Uh, Ross Lyon would have been... Uh, looking at the way we've been rebounding off halfback over the last couple of weeks and would be thinking, all right, we, he, he just hasn't backed his players in. What he's, he's immediately gone for the shutdown. In, instead of backing his players in, they've got a, a good midfield, an excellent forward line and a serviceable defence. In, instead of backing his players in, he's just immediately gone for the shutdown. And I, I think it's indicative of the way that he coaches and I think with a squad that Fremantle have uh, assembled now, um, they've outgrown that type of football. Yeah, yeah. he's got the defence right, but can he actually coach attacking? I don't and think he can, Nick. No, and and that's such a, a, a pity because they've got some really good players in there, as you said. I mean, you've got people like Bradley Hill, you've got Michael Waters, who are amazing attacking footballers and they do run both ways and they're not being utilised 
to their fullest. I, I do think if he tried to play a bit more attacking against us, I don't think that would have gone well for them. Um, oh, I don't know about that, Nick. They've got three of their, three of their we, marking we'd hit, forwards. With him at the helm. Yeah, three of their marking forwards, Hogan, Tabiner and McCarthy, are in their top five least possession getters for the for the match. They're just not yeah. using them. You know, that's that's they're three tough players to to have to match up on, and then you throw in Walters on top of that. Um, you've got Fife in the middle. You've got Mundy who played really well in the middle as well. You've got a couple of young lads in the middle uh, uh, as well. Bradley Hill is a good ball carrier. Uh, they've got enough firepower to be playing to be trying to hit the scoreboard. Um, but I don't think I, the only time I've seen a Ross Lyon coach team try to play attacking football was Fremantle when the assistant coaches were given a little bit of license, and he shut that down after a third of the season. So uh, I don't. I just don't think he's got it in him, to be honest. You know, you may well be right, but there's no doubt that um, he did. Uh, he obviously thought if he if he played Adelaide on a, a open basis that he would have got beaten, and I think he thought his best chances were to play it defensively because um, that right from the word go, that's how it was played. So yeah, um, I, I think that he thought that was their best chance of winning against us. But we're talking about a team who 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 were above us on the ladder, who who had momentum, um, who were in good nick we physically. Oh, I don't know, Mac. Oh, look, I'd, would you look? Would would a Tigers or a um, a Geelong go into the game with that sort of a defensive mindset? No, well, no, they they wouldn't have, uh, because they would have backed themselves to beat us, but. Um... But we have been beaten by teams that have set up defensively against us. Yeah, defensively differently though, Mac. Like Ross Lyon shuts it down at the coal face. Geelong and that they they will set up defensively behind the ball and guard the corridor to push us wide. But Ross mm. Lyon just turns it into a maul. It's it's a completely different type of defence because at least your Geelongs and your Hawthorns will still hit the scoreboard going the other way. But Ross Lyon has not got the ability, in my opinion, to coach a team to hit the scoreboard consistently. And I, I think, as I, as I've said a couple of times now, I won't, sorry, I won't repeat myself, but I, I think they've gone past that as a squad. Well, I can certainly say that I wouldn't want him as my coach anyhow either. Yeah, me either. But let's look at some head-to-heads. Um, and what stands out immediately is that Adelaide went... Uh, one uh, like a fifty-fifty kick to handball ratio, two twenty-five kicks, two twenty-four handballs, um, compared to Fremantle two nineteen to one eighty-six. So uh, look, a real uh, diversion away from what we've been serving up the last couple of weeks. Um, obviously, uh, um, indicative of the 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 close-in football that was played, but it was quite interesting that we went by hand. Um, um, far more than we have the last couple of weeks. Uh, certainly a, a tactic in my view to keep the ball in close um, rather than allow the ball to get into the open. I don't know whether it was a tactic there, Fien, or whether it was just the result of, of the fact is that both sides uh, were going back at it so hard, so hard physically and not no free kicks being paid uh, that the ball was basically just bouncing in between packs and the, a lot of the time they never got, got a chance to even kick the ball. I think a lot of that, the, the, the handball to kick ratio developed out of the uh, the congestion of the game rather than anything else. Not how'd planned. You, how'd you see that, Nick? It was so frustrating. Um, it, <laughs> I think one of the funniest things kind of happened uh, near me in the, the third quarter where um, Atkins actually went to he, he finally, after a handball, 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 he went to kick it and he got smothered. And there's a guy in the crowd just yelled out about stop handballing everything else. And another guy just yells out, he went to kick it. And so they actually had a little argument back and forth um, for about two minutes, which amused us uh, regarding that. But it, the time. it was, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was very much, it, it had to be done because of the structures that were being set up around. Um, and just trying to get that space on the outside. And Matt Crouch um, reported that a number of the other players said, look, we just couldn't get it on the outside because there was so much pressure um, that was being 
put on us and how buggered they were by the end of the game. They just couldn't um, get that run. So um, it was kind of funny just looking at those numbers and I was just keep saying, you know, how many handballs we were having. And it was it was just so indicative of, of that kind of pressure game and you had to keep doing it to mm. try and finally get that break on the outside. Yeah. And we got it a couple of times and they got it a couple of times and then it shut back down again. I yeah, mean, yeah. it was frustrating, but it was actually quite absorbing to watch because you knew both sides were going at it hammer and tong. Look, I still think, Macca and Nick, that it was somewhat of an instruction because in the past, in those close-fought games where there's tons of congestion, what we would normally do is uh, flick it out and then straight onto the boot and often that would result in the ball coming straight back over our heads. And I think Don has decided to play the game in close and back our inside mids uh, to overpower um, Fremantle's. And by and large, I think that's what ha- happened. I don't think Don actually wanted the game terribly open. I think he wanted to actually keep it in close because he didn't want the turnovers. Very good. Well, one of the, the, one of the things that factors that, that half support your argument was uh, Fife's game because every time the ball did get a little bit out, Fife got it. Yep, um, exactly so, right. Yeah, yeah, but there was a Fife rule because how did he get it out a number of times? Well, that's true. That's not the point, Nicky. He still got it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but that that's my impression. I, I don't think Don minded the, the way the game was played, given the tactics that were brought by uh, Fremantle. I, I think Don... And again, I point to his press conference during the week where he was very uh, pointed in his comments about looking at what Fremantle do. Um, and I think he was quite content to play it in tight. Uh, don't, let's not forget that Pikey uh, was assistant coach for West Coast for a, f- for a couple of years. Saw Fremantle up close, um, sees the way they go about it, and I think he basically just backed our inside midfielders to beat them, and that's what happened. Well, I think our inside midfielders in particular, uh, Cam ellis Yolman, I thought he he had an excellent game, excellent. Um, and Greenwood, I thought, was, you know, when, it, when the chips were really down and then the tough guys stand up and do things, he did things. And uh, those two in particular, the, the big body midfielders, they were outstanding. Little Sloney, I mean, he's not big bodied, but uh, in that last quarter, I thought he was outstanding. I had to have a chuckle with him. He, he went, just wasn't he, allowed to kick it in that last quarter. Well, he, he had. He, he was very the, good at kicking it to Pierce. He handballed the ball, trying to uh, outrun the bloke uh, who was chasing him. Of course, he, I think the other bloke got there first, but. Um, but he kept over, it. But Sloney kept it, it, but ended up getting it. Yeah. And but was, but that, was, that was actually a great bit of play because there was nothing up forward and he couldn't go backwards because it was so congested. It was, you know, what can he do? And it was, but that, the way that he ran and did that, you could just kind of feel it lifted the crowd and you would presume being on the field, that would lift you even though we're so buggered because when the, that siren went, so many players both for Frio and for us, just dropped on their haunches. They were yeah. exhausted. Well, that was my point, really, Nicky. Was a bit, you know, he handballed it out, and it took them half an hour to get there, both of them, because they, they were so tired that they plotted to it. But at, he, he did he did end up with the ball, and uh, and, and your point's valid. He had no one to give it to. So, uh, But Slo- I think Sloan was excellent in the last quarter. We, really, when the chips were down, he had a very, very good last quarter. Interestingly, um, for such a hard-fought game, the tackle count was fairly low, uh, 58 to 65 in Frio's favour. You would have expected those numbers to be in the 70s and 80s, but it, I think it was more a game of second and third efforts rather than uh, you know a tackling slog. Um, mm. You know, it was smothers and blocks and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, uh, but a, a surprisingly low tackle count, in my opinion. Uh, Riley O'Brien. Uh, I'm we're gonna I'm gonna nominate him later for the breakout award. Fifty two hit outs to thirty four we had. I thought Riley played an excellent game. Um our disposals per scoring shot uh were up at twenty eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, fr- how fr- many scoring shots were there? Yeah, just twenty eight, but Frio's were forty five, so uh, you know, just that kind of night. But our, our cold face stats were really good. We won the clearances forty six to forty three. Um, we won the contested marks, or sorry, we lost the contested marks, but it was pretty close, 13 to 16. 
Uh, as I said, clearances 46 to 43. Uh, we won the centre clearances 10 to 6, and we were just pipped on the stoppage clearances 36 to 37. Um, they had slightly more turnovers, 87 to 83, but our tackle count inside 50, and this is something that Cam and I uh, mentioned again on the previous show, was the fact that we were going to have to fight very hard to get repeat inside 50s, and that tackle count, 18 tackles inside 50 to 8 from Fremantle, uh, really indicative of the effort that we put in to try and keep the ball in the area and win that ter- territory battle that uh, Don's always uh, carrying on about. Yeah, no, look, it, it was it was very very tough. Um, uh, you're quite right about Riley O'Brien. I thought um, oh, I'll support you on your nomination too. The, uh, I thought he uh, well he dominated the ruck, but not only he dominated the ruck, he became uh, almost another in, uh, midfielder because you have a look at his possessions; they were very very high. And um, I just think he's improving week by week. Uh, next week will be a big test, of course, because he'll, he'll be up against uh, a ruckman, a, qual- a quality ruckman in Ryder, and one that uh, um, was put in his place as a bit of a plotter in Lysett. Uh, Lysett didn't have a very good game at all against uh, Grundy, um, but he, he'll have two of them up against him, and uh, they're regarded as the best ruck duo, so that'll be a good test for him. But like, oh, I think. He'll do, I think he'll hold his own. I think he'll do okay. But, but I thought he, he did a very good job in giving our, our guys a good good look at the ball. Yeah, Nick. really, really loved Rob's game. Um, was pretty outstanding. I mean, the only time that Lob, when Lob got that one shot on goal, that was because Rob had actually, was trying to contest the um, the ball coming in down the other wing. And Lob ran off him and Rob wasn't then able to get to the ball because he was shepherded well off the ball and ended up on the ground. And I thought it should have been a free, but uh-huh. those umpires wouldn't know what rules are. And he ended up with that because he had Sloan marking him. So Lob got the mark. But overall, I mean, it, it's something that I know he's got that ability to do. And Pike actually said it in the um, the aftermatch that he's a ruckman who likes – to get his hands dirty as soon as he's done the tap. And there were a couple of times he was he was hunting that ball. There were a few really good tackles um, that he made stick that their mids weren't expecting to happen. And it kept the ball in and we, we get an, um, another bounce up again. So I, I do think he's got a really good challenge against him next week. And... Um, I don't. He's definitely not going to take a backward step. We know that. Well, and, it's going know, to be what? very interesting, Nicky, next week because he's up against yeah. two genuine ruckmen. Yeah. Rory Lop, in he my is. mind, is bloody lazy for a lad who's as big as he is uh, and with as much natural ability as he's got. I think Rory yeah. Lop is lazy. Um, he wants to play up forward. I think he wants to to be able to play his AFL career without exerting too much. Uh, uh, stress and uh, you know physical exertion and uh, I, you know uh, Riley O'Brien's always going to be that kind of guy, but he's got uh, he's got Paddy Ryder and Scott Lysett next week. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what we do, uh, given that uh, at the moment we've got Himmelberg as his uh, backup. But uh, he, you know, let's focus on this caps, week. I think. Yeah, uh, I don't. Yeah, Berg doesn't do too bad in the ruck. Look, uh, some of the other stats. Um, a deficiency, uh, sorry, deficiency. Disposal efficiency on both sides was down under the seventy. We we're at sixty-five and a bit. <laughs> so they it were at sixty-seven. Yeah, it was a deficiency. Um, contested marks thirteen to sixteen their way. One uh, percent is surprisingly Fremantle was eighty-two to fifty-three. And uh, to this day, we've been doing this rap now for what three years, and I still don't know what one percent is means. Um, I'm yeah. Uh, Metres gains, we were a little bit better there. Uh, turnovers are the same, pretty much. So, I mean, I think in the end, the stat, what the stats show is uh, we had a very uh, specific way of dealing with the congestion uh, and we probably took a few more opportunities in the end than Fremantle. Uh, yeah, well, I think we had a, a few more uh, dangerous sorties up forward and a few more forwards that looked a little bit dangerous as well. Uh, and given by the number of scoring shots that we had, and I think we probably should have won by a little bit more. But 
we didn't in that first quarter. We, we actually we, we killed, uh, I think, the four shots that should have been goals. And if we got those, it may have been a totally different game. Who knows? But, uh, you know, you can't go back and rewrite history. It is what it is, and, that, and then the game went the way it did. I just want to make another comment about uh, Rob O'Brien because I heard him talking on the radio after the game. He was saying that after the last game that he played in, and the, the, he covers about, uh, four, I think he said about 14 kilo, uh, kilometres a game, uh, and plus doing all the rucking and physical effort and on top of that. He, he said he, he had body cramp for about an hour and a half. His total body was cramping. So yeah, it's not an easy job. No. He, was cr- he cramped at the end of this game. <laughs> Trying to watch it run off was, yeah. <laughs> not just his legs. He, he said he's, he's getting his whole body was cramping. Yeah, the funny thing is if we'd have given him the 10 games prior that he probably deserved, then uh, he'd probably be a bit more match fit. But anyway, that's another conversation. Let's go yep. through some individuals, shall we? Matty Crouch, I thought, was fantastic. 39 disposals, 18 and 21. Um, three tackles, two inside 50s, four clearances, um, 13 contested possessions. So he was inside a little bit more. His disposal efficiency was down, but that was pretty much across the board. Um, but uh, five intersteps and uh, about 350 metres gained. I thought he was very good. Yeah, liked his game. I liked his game. He, he got a lot of the ball and... He's one of those that doesn't panic a lot when he's got the ball either. He sometimes will be a short kick. He hasn't got a really long kick on in, in him anyhow. Um, so it'll be a handball or whatever. But uh, most of his decisions with the ball were pretty good today, I thought. And uh, uh, and he's very, very good at competing for the ball, for the hard ball as well. So, yeah, he's right up in the top three, I reckon. Who is that I'm arguing in the chat? Oh, come on, Nicky. Not like you to argue, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> Matty Crouch. Oh, yeah. I really liked um, his second half. He became um, – his job was to drop back into the defence. Yep. And I thought he actually did a really good job at that because that ability to play that loose man, to block up the holes but to be effective and particularly when they were really getting that run on because we tired so much in that last quarter – um, and he just kept repelling all those attacks over and over and over again. Um, I, yeah, he, he's definitely up there in the best for me. Um, and I, I thought Brad was fairly quiet, but, but Matt was, that was a really good game um, overall for him. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say Brad was quiet. <laughs> no. Um, he Cameron... wasn't as effective. No. Cam, Cam in the chat says uh, Marty did work himself back a little bit, so I'm not quite sure who Marty is, but I'm assuming he means Matty. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, dead set right, uh, Matt did work back, actually, um, a lot more. It's not something we normally see Matty working in the back half, um, but it was quite noticeable that he was working behind the ball a fair bit. So um, to me, it just seemed that it's probably the first game where I felt like Matt looked like he w- he'd look fit. Uh, and free in his movement. Yeah, he cruised. He, yeah, he looked good. He looked good. And 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 just on this, kudos to Pike because of what you talked about before. This wasn't our normal game plan that we stick to. It. We want to play our way. We know they're not going to allow us. We're not. We're not going to do that. He adjusted during the game with that sending of Matt back, which worked a treat, and the way that we were instructed to play. So. I think we have to give some kudos to Pike for the and the coaching staff for yeah, what happy, they implemented this week. Happy to do that, Nikki. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, it's interesting that since Pikey started coming down on the boundary and talking to the players directly and getting away from a couple of dickheads upstairs, that it really started <laughs> to go a lot better. Yeah. Uh, did they actually turn up today, or did they get the day off? They must well get the day <laughs> off on match days. Save the club. Well, bit Clarkie, of money. I still saw Clarkie there. Yeah. Hey, uh, Sloaney, as you mentioned earlier, Macca had a really good game too. 33 touches, 14 and 19, uh, four marks and cl- uh, a couple of telling ones there, four tackles, five inside 50s, nine clearances if you don't mind, uh, 15 contested possessions, uh, seven uh, stoppage clearances, uh, nearly 500 metres, uh, five intercepts, three score involvements. You uh, have to just about be BOG again. As long as he didn't kick it. 
Oh, we were, yeah, that was Roval with his kicking in the last. But considering how buggered and everything else they were. Yeah, and, no, I, I think you've and, 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 and the pressure of that game. And and an absolute also kudos to Pierce. He is a bloody good defender. Yeah, Sloan is just so brave. He's so courageous. Yeah. He's so brave. And, and, and even if he is uh, out of gas, out of air, he just, He'll still slog on and just try his guts out there. And, he's number and the one. fact that he's got Cam and he's got Hugh around him to help give him that little bit of protection. He'll still go in and under, but they can help clear the space for him to get it out or he can get it to them. I mean, there were some beautiful little sidesteps from Alice Yolman, um, just to, to get that, that space out. And we know there's some decent midfielders in Freo's side. Well, they had a couple, a couple of guns there, and because uh, uh, what's his name? It wasn't just. Uh, um, who's that guy who haven't played? played about three hundred games. Monday. 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 Yeah. No, Monday. Monday had a very good game as well. So, I mean, they really only had the the, the two five for Monday, but uh, I think, uh, and you're never going to stop uh, those two from getting some kicks. I just think overall we had just had it. We went deeper. Yeah, I think you're probably right there, Mac. And speaking of which, uh, Cam and Alice Yolman, uh, we sort of talked the other day about him being best 22, and he did nothing to harm those uh, opinions. Another strong game by Alice Yolman: 33 touches, 14 and 19, five tackles, five inside 50s, four clearances, uh, 15 contested possessions, um, so nearly 350 metres gained. Uh, just a nut, just a strong inside body, and he keeps his feet. and I, I just love his work inside. Had a very good game, yeah, very good game. As you said, he, he he's, a, he's a very big bodied boy, and and he used it very very well. And um, a couple of times here when he's kicking the ball, he had two or three hanging off him, and he still got his kick away. So uh, I like his game. And I've loved that from both him and Greenwood is that they take the time to compose themselves. They don't worry. They don't panic those kicks anymore. They know that they can play at this speed um, at the AFL. And they've just got such confidence in that, yep, we, we're just going to do it. Um, you can come down, you can tackle me, but I'm still going to get that kick away and I'm pretty much going to get it where I want it to go. Uh, Brody Smith, um Worked his way into it in the second half, I thought. 14 and 11 for 25 touches, three marks, uh, six inside 50s, six rebound 50s, uh, seven contested possessions, went at 72%, uh, disposal efficiency, um, and had, what's that, five, uh, what do you have? Yeah, five scoring forwards. Nearly 500 metres gain. Now, I, I saw halfway through the third quarter they put up metres gain, and he wasn't on the list, so he'd had less than 250 metres gained halfway through the third quarter. So he really became a more damaging player uh, in the latter half of the game, ended up with seven intercept possessions as well. So um, it bounced back after I reckon they put a bit of work into him early and made him accountable. That's that's true. and But uh, his second half was uh, definitely uh, much, much better. And uh, I think it was the third quarter that he got the goal, was it? Yeah. And uh, that terrific goal. And... Uh, that actually almost was like a spark to the side, really. And um, he did a shit one earlier, so yeah, he but, missed one he should have got. Okay, I could I could nominate every other <laughs> player did a shit one, Nicky. Um, well, yeah, there were. But uh, no, I, I, he. I think by the end of the game, he'd, he'd, he'd give the boy a tick because I thought uh, his second half was good. Yeah, the, when that that game was able to open up just that little bit. And he took full advantage of it. it he still had running his leg. really hard. To, oh, he yeah, and he still had to work really hard to get to that space. And and often it was on the back of a contest, a contest, a contest. Flick it out back and forward. And sometimes he's in there going for the the contested ball, getting it out to somebody else, and then the overlap run. Um, but it's nice to see from last week and this week that that consistency is happening. And as I pointed out last. Wait, him and Led are playing better without Miller. Oh, yeah. I don't know whether that's the reason. But the... <laughs> I, 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 I think, think it's the fact that, they're, that Le, yeah, Led's not really being tagged, or if he is, is being tagged ineffectively. Um, but but it is quite interesting that they're 
that that those guys are, are starting to get that free running game going better and Wayne's not there. Look, yeah, I think it's a bit harsh on Wayne. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I think Smith is fast becoming our most important player. He's uh, very important. He, he's, he's a bit of a catalyst and uh, he can break lines and uh, like two weeks in a row now he's kicked uh, momentum shifting goals and or game breaking goals and uh, uh, I hope he realises how important he is because I think he is a bit of a confidence player um, and his confidence should be sky high at the moment because he's very hard to stop and he doesn't take too many possessions to hurt you. You know, it can only uh, it can do a bit of damage just with a, a handful of touches. So, uh, for him to get twenty five, uh, he's always going to do damage like that. And uh, it was good to see him run out of the game too. Huey Greenwood, I thought, was pretty good with twenty two. Uh, worked mostly inside, seven tackles, four clearances, thirteen contested touches, um, four intercepts as well. Um, and I, I, you know, it's that strength inside, and you know. We talked. We've talked before about the imbalance of our inside midfielders compared to our outside runners, but at the moment it's working for us. Well, the fact is that when you've got both Greenwood and Cam Ellis Yeoman, and you've got, uh, and they're generally not on the ball at the same time, which means that you've always got one big-bodied midfielder who's got strength and uh, can earn the hard ball and do the one percenters, and uh, and I think that helps our other boys uh, just hang out a little bit and uh, gives them the opportunity to break with the ball a lot better and also to, to um, uh, try and stand and to try and stop something like a five, which is, as you can see today, very, very difficult. Even if you're standing right next to him, he still gets kicked. Um, but uh, I thought overall, uh, I, how did we go midf- in the midfield? I, I, I thought it was pretty even, but I thought we might have had the edge there. Well, as I mentioned in the uh, head-to-head stats, Macker, if you were listening... Um, I was, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> it was 46 <laughs> to 43 clearances. So, it was, I mean, it was pretty line ball uh, clearance-wise. But the thing about Huey is it's very hard to take down. So he always gets the arms free, always keeps his feet and uh, invariably uh, makes good decisions when he's handing the ball off. He doesn't panic when he's uh, got heat on him. He, he still makes sure that he takes... He takes the tackle and he takes his moment to uh, pick the right uh, bloke to dish off to. And it's not very often you see Hugh Greenwood uh, sell someone into trouble with his disposal. For all those that ever saw Russell Ebert play, um, Greenwood does one thing that uh, Russell Ebert was one of the unique players at doing, holding the ball above his head in a pack, which yeah. sort of distracts the, 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 uh, the tackler. And it gives him the opportunity to... Uh, Sometimes get just burst through, and sometimes to just dish off, dish off if he has to. But uh, he's one of the few players I've seen do that, holding the ball up above his head like that. Yeah, and uh, for those who don't know, as Miley works uh, pointed out in the uh, chat, thanks Miley. Uh, some late breaking news: <laughs> uh, Huey is an ex-basketballer. Uh, shit. If only we'd known that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, that's why we have that's why we have live chat because we get pearls of, <laughs> of information and knowledge from our uh, learned listeners, uh, now, and Moyle is no exception. Now the the chat and Macca also talked about that it was Smith's goal that got us up and going. No, it wasn't. It was Greenwood's long range goal that started off that run of three. Uh, well, he he it it was him that then got us that up and running, and it was like finally we've broken that drought. Leveled the scores. They did get one back, and then we got um, our other ones after that. But um, and, and that was an unusual goal from him because it was you know a fifty meter kick out in space. Normally we see him doing the snaps or working more in close. But it's nice to see that he's got that up his sleeve as well. Um, if we need to use it, but I, I like the fact that he bullies, and he's got that knowledge that he knows he belongs at this level and he can bully the opposition of you can't bring me down yeah no, I like him. yeah now alex keith if um what's the dickhead from richmond what's his name france, if france. france can get an all-australian bloody nod a couple of years in a row alex keith has already got that position wrapped up this year oh. he's having a oh. power of, he's having a power of a season uh, another fantastic game. Um, 
just putting himself in the right positions. Um, He's got go 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 jet arms. There was one stage a ball coming into the forward line, and and they kicked it to their forwards' advantage, and yet he still manages just to get it because they're so long. He got it in. But it's Get positioning too, away. Nikki. It, it's yeah, positioning. It's, really it's not good. just his his wingspan. He gets himself in the right spots. He times his leap well. He uh, isn't flustered. Uh, you know, uh, I, he's he's a gun. And for him to, how fortunate are we to have had Lever in that spot? Uh, him piss off, and then we've got Duday going down after uh, excelling in that spot. Alex Keith just bobs out out of nowhere, and it's just like we haven't missed anyone. It's, no, it's incredible. He's, he's the current intercept king in the AFL. Just to, uh, I think he only got one point. tonight, though. And, well, it doesn't really matter, Nicky. Um, he only get Kelly one, and Hardigan and, and everybody else was doing the intercept marks, not him. Um, but the one thing I do like about when he's got a Nicky is the fact that he's calmness. He he doesn't yep. lock his. He, there's no panic about the the boy. He you can see he weighs up options and he's calm and he just delivers. And uh, look, he he has to be by a country mile in the AA team at this stage. And if he maintains it for me, he's just a lay down reserve because uh, he's just doing uh, the same as do they did and the same as leave it. He just gets it when, it, when it's his job. But the, he's much much calmer than uh, uh, leave it. Do they a pretty calm guy, but. I, I do actually love that comes in the back line. It takes the panic out of it. And when he got that 50-metre penalty, um, I just went, yep, he's going to kick this because I've watched him a couple of times. We had too many tolls down back in the SNFL, so we played him up forward. He's actually a very good forward as well. With a no surprise, though, Nicky. He yeah, was with a forward as, shot. He's a forward as a junior. Yeah. Played all his footy before his cricket as a junior. As a uh, sorry, start again. He played all his football before the cricket uh, as a forward. Well, I think he started with us in the twos up forward, didn't he, Nick? He did. Then we moved him back because yeah. then we needed some tools. And yes, then we got some right. tools back. And and look, <laughs> um, just while we're on that, uh, and just for Simon Moles' benefit in the chat, did you know that Alex Keith was an ex cricketer? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the first I've heard of it. Apparently, he's play cricket. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. Of the rest, I thought D-Mac was pretty good. Uh, I thought Hardigan yeah, was okay, was... apart from... No, Hardigan, Hardigan, yeah, there was one kick, but I actually thought Hardigan, that was one of the best games I've seen him yeah. play. Looked a little he different was, pose. Like You were talking about Keith of leaving his man, etc. Hardigan was doing that as well. And the number of intercepts um, and the good body work he was doing, I was really, really impressed with his game, actually. Yep. He, did, he played an excellent game, Nicky, apart from that. Uh, and I was saying to Mr. Mr. Macken, just as that happened, gee, Hardigan, he, he's going to make a real fool of me. He's going to make a play a, a mighty game today. And I'll have to really praise him up. Then the lobotomy took over and he just <laughs> he he had, had too much time. Too much time Wham. to kick the straight and give a goal. I know he that wasn't was the only right. one. He wasn't the only one. But overall, he did have a good game. But gee, don't give him time to think. He plays a good game when he can't think. Is there any truth and rumour that Hardigan used to be an ex-professional tennis player? I, I'm not sure. Anyway, we we'll very, very good at marbles as a kid, I heard. Yeah. Um, as I said, DMAC played pretty well. Uh, I thought Himmelberg continues to show the value of having a, a footballer at centre-half forward instead of an ex-basketballer. Um, uh, Betts bobbed up when we needed him the most and kicked another screamer. That was just... I mean, you got to watch Betts's goal and understand what he did because he actually yeah. turns inside out. He doesn't... Like, that snap is hard enough if you're turning onto your, onto your uh, preferred foot. But he actually turns the other way, so he's spinning away from the goals when he kicks that. That's a yeah. very difficult thing to do. If you're spinning away from the goals and then you you lay it across your foot just to get enough momentum on the kick, let alone kick it straight, he's, he's just a legend, Eddie Betts. I mean, that, and, that and is like, not... Sorry, Nick. The ball hated him that entire game. The ball absolutely hated him. Like, there were bounces and they were just like, he was running to, and it would just go bang, just away from him. It was, it was like, 
I felt so much for him because nothing and nothing and nothing was working. Well, Riley Knight but, hated him because he led, he led several times when he was leading. Riley Knight three times kicked it at his feet with the guy right up his clacker valve and it made it yeah. life impossible for him. And But the, that particular goal as well shows that, as you said, Phoenix, that value of Himmelberg because there were two defenders for Frio that goes up. Himmelberg contests it and what he does – was he noticed, he went, okay, I can't mark this. But he turned his body slightly and he knew where Betts was and Betts knows where to go as a small forward at the feet of a tall marking forward. If he's not, And that it was a double hand tap down and he angled it to the space for Eddie to do that. Um, yep. and, and it was really noticeable Just this a football game, brain, was, Nick. Yeah, there's a lot of those taps Himmelberg was doing. The, and they were arguing on 5AA afterwards because they're a bunch of idiots. Robbie's like, oh, you know, but you might want to still bring JJ in because they've got to go up against uh, Ryder and, you know, and he might provide more of a headache. And I think the comment in the car at the time was he'll probably provide more of a headache for our team than he will for an opposition team if you bring JJ in. He, he provides go- me with a headache face palming every five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but the way that Himmelberg, he's tall, He's athletic. He is quick. That that goal that he kicked, that little snap, that was, you know, just had to be so fast in order to do that. Um, and he brings it down to the forward line in a contested way very, very well. Now, ex-volleyballer uh, Jordan Gallucci, um, I thought, <laughs> was okay in his return. I looked at a little bit off the pace, but he, he hasn't played in the ones for a while and uh, it wasn't the worst. Um, look, uh, European handball star Lachlan Murphy also didn't have a lot of possessions, but I thought actually just brought his trademark pressure and I thought he was pretty good. So, all yeah. I mean, it was just a pretty... There was probably only two or three, and we'll talk about them in a second, that I, I query, mm-hmm. but all in all, it was a, it was a pretty uh, pretty even performance, I thought, across the board. It was, and there were contributions from all around the ground. You can't win that type of game if you've got uh, great big holes in in, in your playing uh, stock. Um, and they, and I think all of them, but all of them, did, well, all of them contributed at some stage or other in varying degrees. And there's probably, as you say, there's probably two, maybe three that you could say weren't quite up to it on the day or could have had better days. So I'm bringing out the Breakout and Jet of the Week and Wake Up Awards again this week. Here we go with the Breakout Award. Um, look, no one really broke out, I guess, but I'd just like to give the flag to Keithy because whilst he's not completely new in terms of AFL, he's playing a new role and he's just... Uh, seamlessly slotted into that and uh, I reckon he deserves a bit of a nod. Well, I've got no problem with that, but uh, you don't put Riley O'Brien in that category? Yeah, to me, it's it's between him and Rob. Um, I'm reserving judgment on Riley O'Brien until next week. I've I've loved what Riley has brought so far, Mac, but I'm reserving judgment until next week. He needs better quality that he's up against. Yep. Well, yeah, you can only beat what you what you got to play uh, and play against. And I, I agree, Lob is not the hardest, uh, but uh, I like I like the way that uh, Robert uh, Brian would have had his work once the ball hit the ground as well. I thought he used his body, big body, very well actually. Um, but yeah, he's big test comes next week. Look, so. yeah, he I'm happy to go to, with you, Fee. Yeah, I mean, look, he can only he's done everything we've asked of him. I just for me to be convinced that he's a solid. Um, replacement for Source in the longer term. I need to see him uh, come up against uh, some genuine Ruckman. He's not going to have a bigger test than Ryder and Lysette next week. And if he can uh, hold his own against that Ruck combination, um, then uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll be convinced. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair comment. Yep. Yep. Um, Now, look, there's a couple to talk about in terms of the Wake Up Award, and I don't like to be negative, so uh, we won't spend too much on it. But, uh, geez, I said um, to Cam uh, on the pre-game show that this was a game that we needed uh, Rory Atkins 
to uh, step up and show that he can uh, play in big games, in tight games. How did you see it, you two? Well, I, I'm not saying that Rory Atkin can't set up in big games, but, it, but when it's physical like it is today, you won't see him standing up uh, in these type of games. Um, I, I don't know that he actually squibs it. I, I can't remember any particular occasion where... No, it's I not about squibbing quite... it. It's not about squibbing it, Matt. No, but when I say squibbing it, not putting the body in when you when you, he probably should have. Um, but uh, the the type of game it was, um, I think what we got out of Atkins is all you ever going to get in that particular type of game. Yeah, because you didn't get a lot out of DMAC either, but um, DMAC was playing more of a defensive wing role because he was his job was to to chop out. <laughs> Bradley Hill, um, which he did quite well. And for me, Atkins, yeah, there were moments where I thought he needed to be a little bit closer to put on a bit better pressure, um, kind of running around in the circle a little bit. But there was one of the ones in the third quarter um, where he down in their, their forward line that he actually did some really good hard, like hard running pressure and corralled uh, um trying to remember which player it was, but he did that really well. So he's not that bad for me because of the, the style of game it was, just knowing that it, it it didn't quite suit him. It didn't suit any outside player. No, that's a lie. Um, and considering his uh, previous career as a Greco-Roman wrestler, um, you would <laughs> think that he would actually uh, handle the entire a little bit more. But Brody Smith was playing on the other win. And so you just need to look at Brody's stats compared to Rory's stats. Rory's had 18, 9 and 9, 2 marks, uh, 3 inside, 50s, uh, 5 contested possessions um, and only gained 280 metres uh, and turned it over 4 times, going at 44% disposal efficiency. I'm sorry, but it doesn't matter whether it was a game for outside runners or not. The fact is that Brody Smith was able to find a way to be effective and that's what Rory Atkins needs to do. He needs to find a way to be effective in those tight games. And I think uh, him, along with um, uh, Riley Knight, uh, it's time for both of those lads to give way to a couple of new kids, just not so much that they're out of the team or whatever, but just to give these new kids a run. Because as I said a couple of weeks ago, I don't think we know what our best 22 looks like until we've had a look at some of these other lads. Well, I think you raised a good point because um, these are the two boys that I would have nominated too that were, were disappointing. And uh, Riley Knight, um, he is, look, he's a hard nut, but uh, he, at times he just wasn't good enough today, uh, tonight, today. Uh, and uh, he gave away six, I think it was six threes or something like that. And, uh, um, and, he, and he's very disappointing he had... his disposal. Um, it, we wouldn't lose a lot by replacing him, that's what I would say. Yeah, for me, the problem with um, NIDA was whilst he did some of the stuff that we know he can do well in terms of the, the tight in contest, when he got out in the open and he ran hard to become that link man, his delivery to our forwards was not to their advantage. And that's with the type of game that it was, you had to really nail those. You look at the way that Frio, in some instances, were delivering the ball to the advantage of their forwards. Yeah. We couldn't do that. When we've got some really good players down there that we know are up and about, I really want to see either a Chase Jones or a Ned McKenna. So if they want that contest and with the way that Ned played on Friday night, I think Knight has got to be dropped back and they need to bring in McHenry for the showdown. Well, Knight's had yeah. 16 touches, but he's essentially only had five and a half effective disposals for the game. He mm. went at 31%, turned it over six times. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, we've said it before, we love the stuff that Riley does well. We love the hard stuff. We love the tackling. We love the niggle and all the rest of it. But he's got to actually get more of his own agate. He was, he was also named up the ground this week. Uh, I didn't notice that he had a, a had any sort of run with roll. Nicky, did you? Didn't Not look really. like it to I, me. I, it didn't look like it. I, th I think there were moments where he was, um, when we had some of the, the midfield 
all of like the ball ups that he would come into where they were close enough to the forward lines. He would come in to be um, an extra one uh, there. But yeah, he he didn't really have a run with role that I could kind of. Yeah. I, I do have to. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've been giggling because Matthew Hoare has described McHenry as the alpaca polo champion. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how that works. Oh, no, we had to actually recruit him out of that uh, international scene. It was uh, <laughs> quite, quite a tug of war, I heard. Um, but look, when you've, got, when you've got Chase and you've got Ned in the team, I mean, Chase, is un- Chase would be in the team had it not been for that concussion, yeah. let's not forget. Um, and yep. you've got uh, him and Ned doing nothing wrong in the twos, and you've got Rory, who's only who's going okay in the in the open games, but it, you know we've gone through that. Um, and Riley, who's probably just not being effective enough. And also, I'll throw into that mix, mix Bryce Gibbs, who had a, had a defensive role uh, this week, and I thought did okay defensively, but w- we could have done with a bit more distribution from Gibbs, I reckon, as well. And he's only just going at the moment. Um, I think there's I, space I, to... Just on, just on that, Fiend, I yeah. actually had, for the first half, Gibbs was one of our best players. Yeah, I thought he actually I, I played very well. And he, was, and he was trying to be quite proactive and um, the forward movements we were getting in the first half was through Gibbs. I think the, we restruct, restructured up a little bit differently in that second half. With um, So he went more defensive. We then had, and that was Matt Crouch coming back to be that more link man. So I, I think that's where that comes in. So for me, I, um, I'm okay on Gibbs at the moment mm. after that the game. J- just considering the way the game was played and and what we did and what we asked of him, I thought he did everything he should do. Look, he got, he got a useful out of me, and nothing more than that. And he, uh, uh, I, I don't think he was dominant at all in the first half. I think he was useful. And he, he played a handy game, and uh, but look, look, he cost us uh, at least a first rounder in a bit, and uh, I, and he's not playing to that level. Um, he's playing more to you know you mean you trade to pick thirty or something like that. Um, I'd like to see a lot more out of him, quite frankly. I don't think we're getting a lot out of him. Yeah, I'm happy to give Gibbs the wake up award. To be honest with you, um, he's supposed to be a, a an elite midfielder. And at the moment, we're running him off half-back, um, and I'm quite happy to give Gibbsy the wake-up award uh, this week. In terms of the Jet of the Week award, um, I think it really is up to uh, Alex Keith, uh, Rory Sloan, and Brody Smith. Uh, you guys got any preferences there? Um, so what's, what's the criteria for that one? Yeah, pretty best much player. our best player. <laughs> well, I'm giving, well, I'll give it to Sloan then. Who do you reckon, Nick? Oh, it's bloody hard. Um, so if you say it's over the whole game, then I'd probably go. No, a bit it's more between the seven Keith. and the thirteen minute mark of the third quarter. <laughs> 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 then Brody Smith. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think I have to agree with the, the Sloney just just for that endeavour in that last half. Yeah, I'd probably go Matt Crouch actually. Um, but uh, two under one, so slowly it is with an honourable to Matty Crouch. Yep. Um, now, you know, so who we got next week? We've got uh, Port next week. Obviously, it's a big showdown. Um, Port losing on the weekend and being shown that they're probably in the middle of the pack. Uh, so I guess, you know, it is early in the season, but if we want to make a bit of a statement, uh, Port's home game, obviously, uh, it'd be nice to get a win. Well, the one thing that uh, is in their advantage is they've had eight. They'll be having an eight-day rest, and we'll be coming off a, a six-day rest in a very vigorous, bruising game. So that is some advantage to them, I'm sure of it, uh, which will help a little bit of run in their legs. So I'm sure our coaching staff will give us a pretty light week, and that they'd be very stupid if they if they don't, um, our, because our players they'd have to be covered in bruises, etc. After the, the the way the game was played so physically today. Um, but I think we didn't. I don't think we got any injuries out of it that uh, we should, we should see us lose players to injuries. We may make one or two changes along the lines that we suggest, or we may not. Um, but we'd have to still play at our very, very best to beat Port because they are capable of some good footy. And if you look at the game against Collingwood, um, they got smashed in the first quarter, and I think that showed what 
you can do to Port Adelaide. But in the next three quarters, they actually outscored Collingwood by one point for the, in the net total for those, uh, those three quarters. So they are capable of playing some pretty good football. So um, I, I don't see this as a lay down Mazir job. I don't see it as um, uh, same something we can say we, we win for certain. Um, I would just uh, just say I think we can win it, and I hope we do. For me, I really liked because of the the style of game we had today with that heat and that pressure, and we did it for the four quarters, and that type of belief that that can instill um, in a team. And we know that showdowns are regardless of wherever you are on the ladder, they're always been pretty much close games. So. I, I think that will help us a little bit as long as the coaching staff and the recovery is right for the week because, as you said, Maka, it's a problem that we've played that intense style of game and we've only got the six-day break and they've got the eight. Um, so I think at the moment I will still tip more towards Port because of that, um, but I think it should be a cracking game. Yep, cracking game indeed. And uh, uh, leading into uh, the showdown, I'd like to introduce the Cock Rumble of the Week. Nikki, you prepared, are you? Oh, possibly. <laughs> I got one for you anyway. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> well, the, the three nuffies today. Um, basically, <laughs> I, th- I think I think they're pretty good for that. Um, I want to give an anti cockwomble of the week, though, to the Collingwood Football Club. You can't um, go reverse cockwomble. I, I just want to do it. I think it's illegal in some countries. The... <laughs> hey, it's my word. I can do what I damn well like. <laughs> just the, the the stuff they did on Friday night with um, young Kyra Davies um, and the way that they went about that. Um, that was footy clubs cop a lot of crap. Um, and some other that was, that was outstanding. That was, yeah, that yeah, was outstanding. Very true. I, I All just jokes do want to do that, but um, I, I do think the, the three nuffies today are a bit hard to go past. I think they have to win it. What have you got, Fane? Oh, I just think the whole kerfuffle about Port's bloody prison bar, Wharfy, bloody oh, Magenta, no, that freaking that Gansy. That one. <laughs> that I saw that tweet. That was hilarious. Well, they really don't know their history, do they? Seriously. I mean... They've entered the they've entered the AFL. It's a different competition. It's a different bloody team. It's a different bloody everything. The people who should be um, jumping up and down are the Port Magpies, who are actually losing the opportunity to celebrate the heritage uh, as 150 years of uh, the Port Adelaide Magpies Football Club. Um, so, but I guess you know if the if the power want to um, adopt the another team's uh, heritage, uh, then I guess you know whatever makes you feel good. Hey, is that your son, by the way, who's asking what a cock wobble is? Yeah. He thought it was a cock wobble. Yeah. <laughs> Look in the bloody mirror, you... mate. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you um, have to explain it too much. Uh, the, the chat has nominated um, Damien Barrett for saying we need to bring Jenkins back in. Oh, um, God, the Jeff. In the chat <laughs> was, sliding was doors, on... too. He knows very well what sliding freaking doors means, obviously not. And it's never anything that appears in any of his articles. Um <laughs> But it, it's like uh, bloody Alanis Morissette's bloody ironic. The whole thing was not one ironic statement. Um, and Barrett doesn't make one sliding door statement ever. <laughs> well, as PJ Crows pointed out, that um, it obviously meant that um, Barrett hasn't watched us play at all this year. And my comment was, or Jenkins for that matter. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's a, a nice little three nominations. Yep. Who do you want but, to go with? Oh. There's some there's some good ones there, but I I think those those three umpires from today, just there's going to be so much talk about the game that's going to centre around umpiring decisions and certain teams shouldn't have won because of those decisions when it was such a high pressure, hard fought game that two teams battled out honestly. So for me, I think it's going to put a blight um, on on that game. So I'm, I'm going to go with those umpires. That's a reasonable comment. Uh, I, I, I'll go with you, Nicky. I'm actually starting to feel a bit sorry for the umps. Um, oh, come on. No, no, no. Only from the point of view of 
uh, we've messed around with the rules so much, and yeah. there's uh, oh, so yeah. much that, yeah. so so much massaging of of interpretations. Sorry, don't. Uh, are going on at the moment so many directives from uh, Hocking at, uh, and co um, at AFL House I I wouldn't want to be an umpire at the moment and yes they turned in a bit of a shocker today and they haven't had the best of weekends in general but to be honest with you I reckon it'd be a pretty hard game to umpire at the moment uh, and it's it already is. a hard game to umpire as it is so uh I'm well, willing I to go that, with you I? with the umpires, but uh, geez, I'm actually uh, I've actually got a little bit of sympathy at the moment. Well, I accept and everything you said about how difficult it is and all that, but I still hate them, please. <laughs> but but you know from often when I talk about it that it's it's not so much because of what they've delivered on field that that is the result of what's happening behind the scenes, and they yeah. are ultimately responsible. And it's the AFL who keep em- employing ex-players to be in charge of the umpiring department. Mm. You need to actually get umpires in charge of the umpiring department. You need to step back. You need to let them umpire the game as it should be, not for the AFL to try and get a contrived result of higher scoring. Yeah. Well, that's, it's, that's going it's well. Going to yeah, how's that working? Yeah, no, fair enough, Nick, too. Uh, Look, let's end it there. It's been a fun night this evening, but uh, we're hitting the 90-minute mark as usual. Uh, My best efforts at uh, shortening this podcast just continue to to head nowhere. Uh, But it's my own stupid fault. Uh, Thanks very much to uh, Ryan at Smith Partners for uh, his support. Thank you very much to uh, our patrons at uh, patreon.com forward slash AFL Crowcast. Uh, if you want to support us, you can go there or click on the Patreon button at our website at aflcrowcast.com. Absolutely massive effort on chat tonight. Uh, over 900 comments. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually Good stuff love, there too. Look, I actually love interacting with everyone on the chat uh, yeah. during our podcast. It's actually one of the, the benefits of going live and... Uh, for those uh, of you listening on demand, if you can get into uh, Spreaker.com uh, forward slash user forward slash AFL Crowcast, uh, if you can get in during one of our live podcasts uh, and get involved in the chat, it's a good time. There's lots of banter, but there's also lots of pretty good insight as well. Um, and it's just fantastic. So thank you to everyone who participated in the chat tonight. Maka and Nikki, thank you very much as well. Uh, it's uh, always good on a Sunday night, I reckon, uh, and especially good when the Crows have had a good win. So thank you both. Yep, and as you said, it's always good when after we win. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks everyone once again, and we will see you on Tuesday night for Tuesday Night Live. Thank you and good night. Good night, Hello. all.